Williams, and I was born in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Hi, I'm Shantae Tucker from Altadena, California, and I'm a systems engineer at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. My name is Norman Phelps, and I currently live in Orlando, Florida, and I work for the Launch Services Program here at Kennedy Space Center. I'm Barbara Brown, and I'm the Chief Technologist at the John F. Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And I've known since I was seven or eight years old that I wanted to work for NASA. I'm a Launch Operations and Integration Engineer. I am Dr. Lene Quick from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. I am a planetary scientist, and I study the planets and moons, and our solar system. I'm currently at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center working as a social media specialist for NASA Universe. My name is Phil Hargrove. I'm from San Antonio, Texas, and I work as a launch vehicle trajectory analyst at the Kennedy Space Center. And my name is Bree Hill, and I'm a public affairs specialist at NASA headquarters and also your host for today's episode of NASA Science Live. We are thrilled for you to join us today as we celebrate Black History Month. Behind every NASA success story, there are people who make the impossible possible. And today, not only are we celebrating the contributions of African-American trailblazers, but also those who are following in their footsteps, helping NASA to reach new heights for the benefit of all humankind. Figures like Mary Jackson, Katherine Johnson, Gagnon Buford, Mae Jemison have paved the way for generations of African-Americans in STEM careers. And while they may have been the first, they certainly won't be the last. While speaking of the next generation of Blacks and STEMs, we are here with Deja Williams, a JPL engineer, educator, and creator. Thank you so much for joining us today, Deja. Hey, Bree, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Deja, please tell us what you do and what inspired you to become an engineer. So I'm an industrial engineer. I'm working with our training center to create a safer process to train our technicians throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. And what inspired me to be an engineer was, um, it initially it started with a conversation with my mom. She asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, and she led me down the path of engineering. And I've always had a knack for uh, learning how things worked. And I was just always curious about the world around me. Um, so here I am. So what does an industrial engineer do and what made you pursue that field? Good question. Um, so an industrial engineer is someone who looks at complex processes and tries to optimize it or make it more efficient. Um, the reason I went down this path is because I'm a people person and industrial engineering allows you to, to dip your toe in both engineering and the business world. So I get an overarching understanding of how things are built and the difficulty that comes with it, but I'm also looking at how can we make this the fastest way possible? How can we make it, um, how can we not overspend and you be resourceful? Um, so I, I love being the middle person in between those two areas. Okay, well, thank you for that. But um, the word on the internet is you were doing some pretty cool outreach. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, Bree. So I rap about math and science. Um, I want to create a more fun and relatable learning experience for students. Um, so I so I'm making dope music about STEM topics. Let's check out a few of your clips. Energy and force, mathematics, studying the Big Bang. I'm observing something and it may be nothing. A hypothesis could change the game. Okay. Uh, okay, we saw from the left to the right. Parentheses, exponents multiply. Then divide, then add and subtract. Now I don't think that Hermie let me run it back. When I'm going to show you how to do this, how to convert units. All my scholars, raise your hands because we too busy schooling. It's simple, let me. Okay, hey. so where were you when I was in school and needed math mentorship? Thank you for doing this for the kids. Absolutely. What motivates it's you? What motivates you to do this kind of work outside of your job? Um, so growing up, math and science classes were very hard for me. But as I grew in the field, I realized it was less about the challenges that were presented. It was more so the languages that it was being taught to me in. Um, I couldn't necessarily understand all of the words that they were using because 
I, I wasn't always taught by people who understood me or had the same background as me. So I'm trying to build build that bridge where I'm creating more relatable uh, uh, learning resources. Now, we know that diverse representation in STEM is important. Can you tell us why it's important to you? Um, diverse representation is important because of opportunity. Um, it's not about forcing everybody to go into a STEM career, but it's important that people know that it's an actual option. Um, a lot of times I'm telling folks where I work and what I do, and sometimes people don't even know what NASA is. I feel that everybody should have an opportunity to experience uh, launches, to experience the, the wonders of space exploration. So that's why diversity is important. Oh, that is wonderful. Now, we know many of you at home have questions to ask, and we would love for you to join the conversation. Please do not hesitate to send your questions by writing in the comment box wherever you're streaming and by using the hashtag AskNASA on social media. Deja will be answering all of your questions at the end of the show, so please stay tuned. Deja, we will see you in a bit. All right. Thank you. Just like Deja, we have many amazing people working across the agency 24-7 to help us achieve things beyond imagination, like getting to Mars. Let's head over to Muja Gay Cooper, a JPL scientist, who is helping to protect Mars from Earth's bacteria when the NASA Perseverance rover lands on the red planet on February 18th. Let's take a look. It's really important that we send a rover that's clean and we make sure that it doesn't contaminate Mars. My name is Mujige Stricker and I protect Mars from Earth bacteria. The next Mars rover is slated to go to Mars, collect samples so that eventually we can bring those samples back to Earth and determine for the very first time, did life exist on Mars? There's nothing that we can build that's sterile. So we take swabs and wipes of the spacecraft as it's being built. It gets put in an oven, it gets put in various chambers and clean rooms so that we can maintain that level of cleanliness. If we do find something on Mars, we have to make sure that actually came from Mars and not something that hitched a ride. This is the place where the magic happens. Oh, it's definitely fun. In this lab, we look specifically at spores. Spores are those hardy microorganisms that can actually survive if it made it on the spacecraft in the journey through space, through the vacuum. It's very humbling to be a part of this big project because there are hundreds of people that have to come together and no one person that can say, I did this, I made this happen. It's always a we. I owe it all to Carl Sagan and watching the cosmos. I remember being a little kid going to the public library and renting that VHS. And from that moment, the light bulb turned on. It actually was the start of my passion of science communication. We are citizens of our universe. We have to be good ambassadors when we are exploring and its other moons. So it's the right thing to do. We are now joined by Dr. Charles Norton, Associate Chief Technologist at JPL and former Special Advisor for Small Satellite Missions at NASA Headquarters. Charles, thank you for joining us today. Oh, thanks so much, Pri. It's really great to see you. It's good to see you. Now, sir, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what made you become interested in science and space? Yeah, so really, Pri, I see myself as a product of the space age. I'm actually originally from Long Island, New York. Um, my mother there was a mathematics teacher. Uh, but my dad actually worked on the Lunar Excursion Module at Grumman Aerospace in Bethpage. Uh, so even though, sadly, he passed away not long after I was born, um, I'm sure they both had a big influence on my uh, uh, decision to uh, study uh, science engineering and, and go into this field. That's fantastic. Now, before you were the chief technologist, I understand you were the special advisor for small satellite missions. Can you explain what that means? Yes, exactly. So uh, I spent a couple of years at NASA headquarters. And in that role, I was really responsible for helping the agency understand and look at how small satellites could provide an innovative approach towards uh, discovery and Earth, astrophysics, heliophysics, and planetary science, as well as the role that small satellites could have to impact technology development. And these small satellites, they're really quite amazing. You know, they can be as small as 
one kilogram and 10 centimeters on the side of them in your hand. Others can actually be the size of a small refrigerator. And they, they really are a disruptive innovation that are allowing us to increase our science return, the diversity of missions that we can perform, uh, the rate and speed at which we can develop and launch and fly these missions. We're also spurring our community to think about new observation techniques, which can help improve um, our understanding of not just Earth, but the universe around us. Hmm. Now, how can the use of small satellites give more people, including African Americans, access to more, um, to learn more about their planet and space? Yeah, that's a great uh, question. Well, you know, these small satellites really started out in universities as a training mechanism to help students and others learn about space and how to develop these missions through a hands-on approach. And again, so, you know, one of the important ways in which these small satellites address that question is they're helping to democratize space. Really, nearly anyone now um, at the university or at other institutions can participate in developing these missions and advancing our knowledge of, of the planets and space and the world around us. And, you know, the community of people that are developing these small missions are really just very welcoming and supportive. And we're always looking to grow the, uh, not just the number of missions, but also the number and variety and diversity of people that are involved. Can you share why representation in the STEM field is so important in the Black community? Yeah, it really is very important. You know, I really see it as another avenue to sort of showcase the wealth and uh, imagination and creativity that the African-American community has. You know, we've seen this in other areas to music and art and dance and poetry. So really, it's just essential for the broad community now to see the contributions that African Americans are making and have made, uh, both in the past and present. And now that you know we're recognizing and celebrating these contributions more directly, it's really having a positive impact in growing our presence in STEM. So it's you know I'm just really proud to be a part of the community and help advance this this cause. Charles, thank you so much for your insights. We will be right okay. back with both Charles and Deja to answer your questions at home. Remember to join the conversation and ask your questions using hashtag AskNASA in the comment box anywhere on social media. But before we answer your questions, let's meet Renee Horton, an engineer at NASA's Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans. Renee is making history, preparing astronauts for their first journey to the moon. We all want to go back to the moon. Getting us back to the moon in this generation sparks a whole new generation of explorers. Hi, my name is Dr. K. Renee Horton, and I am boots on the ground for SLS. We actually weld our liquid hydrogen tanks and our liquid oxygen tanks on this. It is the largest weld tool in the world. It's the only one of its kind. It stands 170 feet tall and it has a diameter of about 27.6 feet. So as a quality engineer, we make sure that they're actually meeting the requirements they're supposed to meet. They do a phased array ultrasound, which goes in and checks to make sure we don't have any defects in the weld. To get up and to pull up the news article and they're talking about what you do at work, is amazing for me. I really love detective novels, and so I'm an avid reader, and I actually write children's books in my spare time. My children's books are about um, Dr. H exploring the universe. <laughs> Each day I walk into the factory, I know that I'm putting my footprints in history, and that's a pretty big deal for me. As you've seen, there are many people working on amazing things here at NASA, but for those watching at home who may want to be a part of all of this excitement, how did they get here? Charles and Deja, what would you say to someone who may be interested in following in your footsteps? What kind of advice would you offer? Charles, why don't I start with you? Do you have anything to add to that? Yes, Bree. I think uh, from my experience, I think it's really important to build meaningful connections with colleagues. There's so much that people can learn from each other. And for individuals to always be willing to share their expertise and their knowledge. And 
And of course, you know, these days, you know, oral and written communication skills are so important in communicating and conveying your ideas. You know, it's an important strength to, uh, to continuously develop. And Deja, do you have any thoughts to add? Yes. Yeah, so my advice is to just go for it. Don't be afraid or back down from challenges. Know that you belong in their space for you in any place that you want to be, especially here at NASA. Thank you guys so much for this advice. And now we have some words of wisdom from people all across NASA. My advice to anyone who wants to pursue a career in STEM. Be curious about the world around you. Never give up. Believe you can do anything you want to do. Work hard. Work hard. Perseverance is the key. Be willing to put in the time and effort that it takes to get the knowledge and training that you need. Make sure you always put your best foot forward. Do your very best. To find your own path. Find a mentor. Asking questions whenever you have them. They give great advice. It might not always be advice that you want to hear, but you know it's for your own good. Don't let anyone distract you from doing the very best you can to meet your goals in life. Don't be afraid to try and fail sometimes, but if you fail, learn from it and use that knowledge to find the path to success. I would not be where I am today if it wasn't for having such great mentoring beginning in high school and, and, and going on throughout graduate school and, and obtaining my PhD. And continuing to challenge yourself. Take a lot of math and science. And to find ways to integrate math and science in your everyday playtime, in your adventures, and in your extracurricular activities. Seek out those opportunities that will lead you along this path and never give up on your dream. Pursue their dreams. Go for that dream of yours. Dream, dream big, and act on it, and hopefully one day I'll see you here at NASA. So let's jump into our Ask NASA questions. Our first question is from XXGamer519XX on YouTube. He asks, what advice would you give to those aspiring to work at NASA one day? Charles, would you like to go first? Yeah, so I think for those that are looking to work at NASA, you know, there are many internship opportunities that are available across the agency. So my advice would be that's a great first step to understand the agency and for the agency to understand you and to find a, a good way of having a match with your interests and those of the agency. And Deja, do you have any advice to give XXGamer519XX? Yes, uh, I agree with what was just said. I was personally an intern first at um, NASA JPL, so that is very true. Um, but before I got that internship, um, my beginning years in college, I made sure I got a lot of experience before you know, I, I even submitted. So I, I wanted to be prepared for the opportunity. So do whatever you can do to, to gain experience in, in the field that you want to. So create your own projects, go into the classes that are talking about or teaching about the, the field that you want to go into. Thank you. Angela on Facebook asks, how can I join NASA projects? Charles, do you have well, any suggestions? Oh, sure. Well, of course, you know, um, there are many ways. Uh, one way is to be uh, employed by NASA and then uh, identifying a project of interest that you want to work with. But I would say equally important, uh, if you happen to be at a university or maybe even at a uh, company, would be to um, seek out the principal investigator for a mission or many of their key team members and uh, just communicate your interest and your background. And I'm sure in many uh, mechanisms, in many ways, they could find an appropriate way to help you contribute to the mission. And Deja, how about your answer? Yes, so um, at my university, we have uh, multiple teams that, that work on extracurricular activities where we're submitting proposals and uh, examples for different missions that we have going on. So um, I know that we have a Mars rover team at my school and, and, and different projects like that that could get you, you know, working on NASA things before you actually get employed by NASA. Marianne on Facebook asks, what can members of the non 
um, Black, Indigenous, peace, people of color community acts to do to address inequality in industries of science and technology, like NASA, as members of the lay public. Mm -hmm. um, Deja? That's a good question. Um, a lot of times I found, uh, I found it when I am coming in contact with, you know, people who are not black and they are, they are welcoming in class. That's, that's super important. They're welcoming when I come into work. That's super important. Um, you have those conversations. Let me know what opportunities are, are coming up. Um, I, I feel like a lot of times there's a secret society when it comes to STEM opportunities and just making those opportunities widespread and known to all communities, I think would be very helpful. And Charles, how about you? Yeah, I would agree with Deja. I mean, I know that uh, we both have been parts of societies like NSB, National Society of Black Engineers, but there are also other technical societies for many uh, different ethnic groups. And there are professionals in those organizations that can certainly act as mentors and help uh, you reach that stepping stone of getting involved uh, with a uh, NASA project or, or even not even a mission, but sometimes even the research and the scientists that come along with the data analysis. So I would definitely uh, work through the community of these uh, organizations. Now this question is for Deja. Misty on Facebook asks, females are still a minority in most STEM fields. What would you tell young ladies today about STEM fields in order to build their interests? Hmm. Um, just don't be afraid. Uh, I, I grew up playing basketball, which is a male dominated field. So <laughs> go don't be don't be afraid. Don't sit in the back of the class. Sit in the front of the class. Ask those questions. You you belong there. Um, you may not know the answer. Don't don't feel like you're not smart. It, if you have the question, I'm sure a bunch of other people in the in the class have that question as well. So knowing that you belong and have that confidence, I, I think it'll get all of us women through. Um, so I have a question from Sasori Adesaki on YouTube. They ask, can anyone who is undergraduate work as an intern at NASA? The answer is um, yes. Charles, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an undergrad intern, so of course, yes. Okay, so our yeah, next question is Deshaun. I'm oh, sorry, sorry, one more sorry, time, sorry. Charles? Say, um, yeah, I mean, I've had uh, undergraduate students myself. I've even had high school students uh, that I've mentored uh, over the years. And, uh, you know, many of them have gone on to become professors at universities and, and have gone on to other institutions. So it's it's uh, definitely possible. There are many uh, ways to apply for those roles. Awesome. Um, now, Deshaun from Facebook asks, what's the best advice to give fat future NASA employees when they are struggling and on when they are struggling and how can that employee or employees succeed in life? My um, answer would be, oh. We can go to Deja, Deja started. Well, yeah. my answer would be one thing I did as a new employee is if I if I found someone who was doing something interesting or even just someone sitting and eating lunch, I would ask them to have ask to have lunch with them. And I get to sit there and have a 30 minute intro to what they were doing. Um, and that is how I've been able to grow in my career is learning about what's out there and um, just getting a little taste of people's experiences. And Charles. Oh, Deja's exactly right. I mean, um, I found over my career at NASA that, you know, literally any question you have can be answered. It doesn't have to even be science related. You know, there's so much curiosity in this community that, you know, one could very easily um, get to uh, understand better how they can contribute to the agency's mission. Um, and should never be concerned about that if they have um, any struggles or difficulties by just simply reaching out and, and talking with your colleagues. And it could be about any subject. 
people are just very warm and welcoming here. Ali on YouTube asks, was there a specific moment or event that pushed you in the direction of pursuing your career at NASA? And Deja, can I start with you? Yes, so what pushed me uh, into this career was actually being a part of the National Society of Black Engineers. Um, before being a part of this organization, I didn't know that working at NASA JPL was even possible. Um, but going to the conferences and, and seeing that there are opportunities available, um, that's what kind of pushed me to make this a goal to work at NASA. And Charles? Yeah, I'm probably dating myself a little bit. It was a little bit by accident, but I remember when the Netscape Navigator browser was first released, <laughs> one of the first internet browsers, and I was looking for an opportunity to do work in a high-performance computing, and NASA at the time had supercomputers that were among the top 500 fastest in the world. So I did a uh, search long before Google was invented and uh, found there was an opportunity to work uh, with JPL. and. You know, I had planned to actually only spend a few years at the lab um, and then go ahead and uh, look to become a professor. Uh, but I'm still at JPL and enjoying it. So uh, maybe I'll pursue that in uh, retirement someday. Well, that is all the time we have for questions today. Thank you so much for joining us today, Charles and Deja. Absolutely. Well, thank, thank you, you for having and many thanks to all of you who've joined us from home. If you would like to learn more about some of the amazing people featured in today's episode, please visit go.nasa.gov forward slash Black History Month. Thank you for joining today's episode and see you next time.